Hello, and welcome to the final episode of Live All Your Life on the Voluntary Virtues Network. The reason it's the final episode is that I'm revamping the entire show. We're going to completely change things up, and the new show will be called The Free Life Solution. Now, we're going to get to the final segment of my interview with Tiger Lily Gonzalez here in just a moment, but uh, I want to take a minute and just talk to you about something that uh, has really been consuming my mind lately. And that is that, it, generally speaking, in the thinking population, in the anarchist movement, in libertarian circles, uh, people are looking for solutions. People are looking for ways to get free. But a lot of times that energy is put into philosophy, which is great, uh, or uh, advocating the uh, disassembling of the government. Again, I, I am an advocate for that. However, the big mistake that I see people making is that they're trying to achieve personal freedom by changing society and it is never gonna work. Now, I don't mean to be a pessimist and say we're never gonna have a free society because that's not what I mean. What I mean is you cannot achieve personal freedom by trying to change other people. It can't happen. That is just not the way it works. And then as anarchists, of all people, we should be able to realize that because everything comes down to you and your decisions. If you own yourself and you're not free, it's your fault. So I am here to tell you that it is time to break these paper fucking chains that hold us back. It is time to take care of ourselves, to stand up and lead your life as a free human being. And that's what this show is going to be about. We are going to look at actual real, real world solutions on creating freedom in your own life. I can think of no better way of introducing this show than introducing uh, a book to you that can have a profound effect on your life. Uh, it's called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World by Harry Brown. Uh, it may actually be out of print. This is a very old copy, but you can find them around. I encourage you to get yourself a copy because we're going to be going through this book for the next uh, several episodes. I'm going to chapter by chapter highlight just a couple points. I'm not going to read the book to you or anything, but uh, we are going to go through a couple of points on that book in every episode, maybe a five or ten minute segment just discussing that book. So if you'd like to read along with me, I think you might get a lot of benefit out of that. And I think it could be really fun to start a conversation about that, uh, about the contents of that book uh, from an anarchist point of view. Another book uh, that was also given to me actually by the same friend who has created a tremendous amount of personal freedom for himself and his own life. He's a, he's a fantastic example. And this friend of mine, he's not only created a tremendous amount of personal freedom for himself, uh, but he's, he's helped me out a lot too. And the other book that he's recommended that we're going to be going through a bit right here, How People Change by Alan Wheelis. Now, this is actually a psychology book, but uh, so far, I'm about a third of the way through it. Very small book, and we will be going through that probably in conjunction. So if you want to get both of those books, the more the better. Uh, however, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World is definitely where we're going to be focused on. Now, this is only going to be a small segment of the show, though. This is not a book club show or anything like that, but it can be a valuable part of that conversation. Where we're going with the rest of the show, rather than interviews and philosophy and talking about how horrible the government is and pissing and moaning about all of the oppression that's going on. We're actually going to be focusing on solutions that you can implement into your life to live free. So we basically have two different approaches to living free that we're usually presented with. One is living outside the state, such as uh, agorism, or just avoidance altogether, workarounds, and I'm a big fan of this method. However, I think sometimes the impression is if you're going to do that, you have to live in the dark ages. You know, you can't, uh, can't use roads if you're avoiding the state, right? There is another approach, and that is to just become uh, independent enough, wealthy enough, 
and live within the state, you know, uh, tolerating the things that you can tolerate, right? Uh, but my show is actually going to be a conglomeration of both of those methods. We're going to show you all kinds of workarounds to avoid having to deal with the state altogether. But that doesn't necessarily mean living like a hermit in a cave in the middle of nowhere, okay? So we're going to talk about uh, living free within your urban environment with modern amenities, etc. And financial independence. If you have had job struggles, don't get a job, okay? Entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial endeavors are a huge key, in my opinion, to personal freedom. And I'm going to be lining out with you a lot of options uh, to be able to achieve financial independence for yourself. Because if you can get um, away from the rat race, I mean, this, this is the big problem with living within the system that we are living in in the society is that there's expectations put on you to have to live within this freaking rat race, this eight to five, Monday through Friday, living for the weekend rat race, barely keeping up with your bills and dying with nothing. I mean, this is the kind of the pattern that we've set up for ourselves. We need to get out of that crap. Okay, so we are going to get out of that crap. And I have uh, guests coming on who are going to share their expertise in everything from money management to, uh, you know, personal finances, investing, but also off grid solutions such as agorism, such as growing your own food, etc. Okay, so basically the theme of the show is stop bitching and start living. That's what we've got to do. Okay, I want to be free. I want you to be free. And this show is going to be the solution to your personal freedom. Yeah, I would like to change society. I would like to see an end of government. I would like to see the end of the atrocities that we're faced with. And I think it is an important conversation to have. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have that conversation. But I see too many people just mired down in trying to change the world when all you really need to do is change your world. If you own yourself, then own it. I want you to live free. I can't wait to do this with you. I hope that you'll join me. It may take another week or so to get some production uh, caught up for this new format because it's going to be a lot of small segments. It's going to be a lot of work to put together. So bear with me as we get started here. But very soon, in the next week or two, we'll come out with the new show, The Free Life Solution. And I'm going to be putting it out on the Voluntary Virtues Network, along with my own uh, website at liveallyourlife.com. And I hope to even rebroadcast this as podcast, etc. So tune in, join in, love to have the conversation with you. And if you have solutions for living personal freedom, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, brewing your own beer or whatever it is, pirating shows or <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Okay, if you found a solution that can have uh, an impact on your own personal freedom, I'd love to hear from you. So please contact me. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let you see the rest of the interview with Tiger Lily now. And I will sign off from this show and I will see you on the next adventure for the Free Life Solution. Live free. Tiger Lily Gonzalez, you prefer to go by your full name here? Is that, yeah, that, that's I, okay? Whatever anybody wants to call me. Cool. Lily, Tiger <laughs> Lily, you know, some people are just more comfortable calling me. It's like the first time I'm introduced, uh, if somebody introduces me as Tiger Lily, it kind of sticks. And it's kind of, you know, so so Lily, Tiger Lily, Liliana, that's my, what my family, Mexican family calls me, um, Lil, um, Bitch. <laughs> I, I respond to everything and I don't get offended by anything. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. The utility of the moment, right? Right, right. So uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, involvement with freedomizerradio.com and what's going on there. Well, what happened is that I, um, I became an anarchist. I guess um, I was first, um, I was in the Marine Corps. When, from 79 to 83. I'm 53 years old. I was born in 1961. And I was, um, uh, I found out about Jose Garena. Do you, are you familiar with the Jose Garena case? 
I'm sorry, I'm not. Okay, that's okay. About two or three years ago, he was he he was a um, Marine vet who served two tours in Iraq, and he lived in Arizona, and he was slaughtered by a SWAT team in Tucson um, over some uh, alleged drug uh, issues. It's the war on drugs. And um, Stuart Rhodes, are you familiar with Stuart Rhodes? Uh, you got me again. Okay, Stuart <laughs> Rhodes uh, was the um, legal advisor, one of the primary legal advisors for um, Ron Paul, and he is a libertarian, and uh, he's a big constitutionalist, and he uh, found he's the founder of OathKeepers.com. So when I heard about this um, Jose Garena thing. Um, I, I got very involved and I went to a memorial on Memorial Day, I think it was three Memorial Days ago. And I met um, Stuart Rhodes and a bunch of Oath Keepers, and that's what they call themselves, Oath Keepers, and um, packing, because I always, I always pack. I don't know if you can see, because um, I, I live in Utah, so everywhere where it's, I'm not going to get you know um, killed for uh, practicing the two A, the so-called two A. I try to um, use my my wear, wear my weapon as just just to kind of get the public used to the idea that it's not just cops that have that that sh you know can uh, open carry or that can ha uh, defend themselves. So when I went to the, the this memorial. Um, uh, I met there was there was a bunch of constitutional constitutionalists there, and everybody was saying it was the same thing. It's not the police; it's the policies. It's not the police; it's the policies. And um, one person came up, and by his name is Bill Bupert, B U P P E R T, and he is the founder of ZeroGov.com, and he got on. On you know, Stuart Rose was letting everybody speak, and he got on and he said, "I've been listening to everybody say that it's not the police; it's the policies." And I'm here to say, bullshit! It is the police. And that was the first time I had heard that. And and uh, uh, well, I that that I heard somebody say that in public. And my husband nudged me. We've been married. Um, 20, uh, 32 years now. He nudged me. He says, "Oh, you're going to want to get a get a hold of him, you know." So he's talking about um, uh, these these libertarian ideas that that were really the the first time I've had I had heard the concept of we really don't need to get back to the Constitution. We need to try something different. That didn't work, as evidenced by the fact that we now have the biggest government in the world and we have the most prison population on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so um, Stuart Rhodes let me speak, and um, and I, that was a shock to me. I wasn't prepared to give a public speak speech or anything like that. And so when I taught, um, I kind of got a standing ovation, especially from the family, because the family is of Mexican um, descent, and they speak Spanish. They, you know, the the wife, the and the family are uh, bilingual, and most of them, some of the older people speak only Spanish. So I really connected with them, and um, uh, and the the thing about it is, when the thing was over, I got bombarded by the family and by some people who wanted to hear more about what I had to say, which was, you know, I was really angry. What had happened, and and then um, I told my husband, "Oh my gosh, where's Bill Bubert? I wanted." And he says, "Honey, he gave me his card, and <laughs> and he wants to meet up with you." And I'm like, "Oh wow!" So on the card it says zerogov.com, and so that like again, my first time to ever even uh, how is it possible not to even have a gov a, a government? You have to have a government. I mean, you know what I mean? So um, Bill Bubert Someone to introduce me to this, and then um, I started open carrying, and I started, uh, um, I you know started looking at the police tyranny. I was living in Las Vegas, and I got involved in some legislative stuff based on um, I don't like to wear a helmet when I ride a motorcycle. So you know I started doing some research and found out that wearing a, helmets are basically superstitions. Um, it's it's not true that because you wear a helmet. You're gonna. Your life is gonna be saved. There may be some instances, instances in which wearing a helmet may protect you a little bit, but bottom line, um, I compare it to when the world is was flat. People used to sail, um, 
you know, to, to prove that the world wasn't flat to get to the, you know, to get to India back then. And it, and if the sailors didn't come back, the, the, the people in the in, in the West in Europe would say, well, that's because they fell off of the earth. I mean, the, the world is flat. And if they came back, well, it's because they didn't go far enough. Well, it's the same with helmets. People think that by wearing a helmet, you've got an extra layer of protection. But when the laws uh, became such that you had to wear helmets, um, the the fatality rates dropped. But but exponentially so did the motorcycle riding because a lot of people didn't want to wear helmets and they says you know they started selling their their motorcycles and all of that so um, I compare the this helmet uh, myth mythology uh, to the mythology of the world is flat because how many dead people who how many fatalities of motorcyclists who were wearing helmets uh, if they were alive today how many of them would say, well, you know, I didn't see something, didn't hear something. I mean, the helmet was too big. The wind ca caught underneath and it propelled me. I know you're a motorcyclist, so you know what I'm talking about. And, and if, they were, if they were alive, if, they, if the dead could speak, they would say, it was the helmet that contributed to my demise. It's the same way with the sailors back in the olden days that were trying to prove that the world was round, that if they were alive, they would say, it's not because the world was flat. It was because I got sick or we had a storm or we crashed or whatever um, and so and so that's what got my my critical thinking going and with each which which with each indoctrination with each thing that I started to um, rise above the the, the Kool-Aid and the programming um, I started feeling um, in a way kind of empowered but in a way when I espouse these these um, ideals um, I would get uh, venom thrown at me and I thought well you know maybe I'm not communicating properly and it was it it you know so you asked me about freedomizer radio so um, because I was open carrying one of the things that I, I was I would do is I was very aware of the police state in Las Vegas they have one of the highest perhaps the highest murder rates of cops of, of murdering innocent people and um, I saw somebody um, that I thought was getting violated so I open carried I was wearing my vest it still had my Marine Corps em emblem on it which I don't wear anymore because I don't believe in the state and I had my gun in my um, hip and a camera in one hand and my dog leash because I was walking my dog and I was at a safe distance and um, long story short a couple of the, the two cops I could hear the one cop inside of the the police car say um, he said, the lady with the camera, the lady with the camera. He wasn't saying the lady with the gun. He was saying the lady with the camera. I later on found out that the reason they were very, um, um, they didn't want the camera was because what they were doing was actually unlawful. They were school police and they didn't have the authority to be arresting in the capacity that they were arresting this man. I found that out later. So what happened is that the, um, uh, the cop came up to me, there were two cops, one of them, and, and uh, he says, uh, turn your camera, they, well they both came at me with their hands on their guns, and I captured this in a 50 second video that's kind of, you know, it's got like 10,000 views I think, and it says, uh, put, the cam uh, put, put the camera down, put the camera down, and I'm like, well I'm just, you know, recording, you know, because I'm a concerned citizen, and, and so I turned it off, and, and, and one of the cops says, uh, put your hands behind your back, and so they handcuffed me, and then he said, get down on the floor you know how they give these commands you know they are used to getting control and I says uh, um, no if you want me on the ground you're gonna have to shove me to the ground and I have a gigantic bleeding hemorrhoid and if you do that I may bleed to death and it's gonna be on you well that kind of shook the little guy a little bit and he says alright well then just stand against the wall well I, I hope that I think that because I shook him up with the way that I reacted um, I was I, I they forgot that I had my camera still so I turned it back on so I'm going like this with you know back and forth and I, I recorded about 37 minutes of raw footage and 
and uh, I, and then I sent the information to a local like Channel New, uh, 8 News out, out, out there in Las Vegas, and I got a little bit of, of publicity over that. So from that publicity, I got more and more and more, you know, people wanting to be for me to be on their radio shows, and then I found uh, Proof Negative found me, who is the founder of Freedomizer Radio. Proof Negative um, has is an awesome guy who is a libertarian Ron Paul kind of supporter. He's still a constitutionalist. Um, I have um, it, I have the, the this issue of I don't know. I, I, it's too difficult for me now psychologically to deal with the constitutionalists that are so stuck that that we have to honor the red white and blue and we have to um, work with the system and I'm beyond the system I'm beyond I don't cry anymore when the Star Spangled Banner gets played I don't you know and uh, we were I live in a Mormon community out in the woods uh, in Utah and uh, I went to a water board meeting with my husband just for the heck of it one time and they all know me as the open carrier and the Mexican <laughs> because I'm the only the brown the darkest person in this community right and um, and so when when and my husband is you know with me he kinda came with me kicking and screaming this whole uh, awakening uh, really did um, um, I don't know kinda harm my marriage a little bit because it's like he just wants to live out his old he's 15 years older than me and and he's retired and he just wants his old he just wants to die with his old lady I mean you know he doesn't want his old lady getting put in jail which I got put in jail one time uh, for 24 hours and that was another story um, but but uh, so we weren't exactly on the same page and now we are finally on the same page and I, I thank Lark and Rose for that because my husband has read his book the most dangerous superstition twice and he's been very good at, at you know, um, um, sharing his knowledge. Although he's more of a because he's a guy and he's a retired Marine officer and he's big and people know him and people kind of respect him. The constitutionalists, it, it's it's um, it, I guess it's oh it's not as um, it doesn't come across as shrill. When I speak, it's more like Sarah Palin. You know what I mean? It's like the shrill bitch. You know, she just doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. And you know, she uh, does she even read any books? And you know that kind of thing. And it's like you know you you got to be quiet. So, so with Freedomizer Radio, I, I started doing a show, um, and it, it was really working. And that, this was during the time that I was still kind of a minarchist, kind of you know working my way through to anarchy. And with uh, Freedomizer Radio, I started to interview people, just gave them a platform to talk about the violations that they had experienced. People, um, survivors of people who, of children that had been killed by, by police officers. Um, I really delved into the Thomas Kelly case, which I know that you're familiar with. Um, and I delved into, and there was, and there was so much I was bombarded. And it got to the point that I was having nightmares. Um, I was, I was, um, I, I just felt too deeply. And, and um, I was getting depressed and I started eating so I, I got like, like 20 pounds more on me than I need to um, but the one thing so so I had to quit Freedomize Radio and it was because of that psychological stress of you know the the compassionate um, um, fatigue I think there's a terminology for that so my position so uh, I took a break and then I thought okay well um I feel better now, and I'm going to go back to Freedomize Radio because he kept, he kept, he was my friend, and he's been at my house a few times, and I love him dearly. Um, so he says, you know, we're ready for you anytime, Tiger Lily. And I says, okay, well, before being an activist, I was a registered nurse, and that was for like nine years, and I did everything from birth to death. In, um, I was licensed in 11 states, and I worked in four of those states, and I was kind of a contract nurse, so I, I saw some really really stunning things that burned me out so I've taken a break from that for to do the 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 activism you know with the with the gun rights and with the police brutality so I thought okay maybe now is time to impart some of my um, knowledge that I have to keep people safer in hospitals to tell them what to look out for because our healthcare system, as you um, probably know but since you're young and you're a man you probably don't use it as much but it is a freaking disaster did you know for example once I when I started preparing for my show I started getting really educated there's a new report that came out and so it was published in nrp.org 
that between 210,000 and 440,000 people a year are being killed by our healthcare system. And in my opinion, that is even a conservative, uh, even more conservative than when in 1998, when Newt Gingrich, Newt Gingrich was very involved in trying to find out what, what's going on in healthcare systems. He would say, the hospitals will, will charge you, um, will one out of three patients will get a problem by the hospital for which the hospital will then turn around and charge you to cure so when I started doing all of this new research and it's like yep it makes more sense these numbers are more in in line with what I was thinking and back then I was a nurse nurse uh, advocate and a, a definitely a patient advocate and I didn't think I could with a profession more than the medical profession and that's because um, I, I used to call doctors and they would throw the f-bomb at me and tell me where they were really rude and especially if you wake them up and I kind of uh, I can understand and empathize um, with some of that but but I I got burned out to the point that there was just so much injustice and I says I want out so my husband says well what do you want to do I mean uh, I will support you. I've, I've got two retirements now. He's, you know, over 61. He's 67 now. But at the time, he says, I got. To, I can afford to, for you not to have to work. What is it that you want to do? And I said, well, I love riding my motorcycle, and I love to write articles. And in fact, when I was a nurse, I got published in the L.A. Times and the Houston Chronicle, the um, uh, several other kind of prestigious publications that by by mainstream uh, media um, uh, standards. So. So that's that's when I you know started you know getting into um, uh, started kind of waking up a little bit because part of my job as a reporter slash writer slash seller of advertising for this free motorcycle magazine was to network and so I would go to these motorcycle groups and they would tell me that you know the cops are being mean to them and me and my stupidity you know and in my naivete I thought well dude brush your teeth, comb your hair, <laughs> cover up the tattoos, and the cops won't bother you. I mean, it's that easy. Um, so then I started a test in which, um, you know, I, my friend David Stilwell, who is the founder of Gorilla Lawfare, and if you do a, you go to YouTube and do gor YouTube slash youtube.com slash gorilla lawfare um, you will see that he's got like millions of views on his stuff because um, he he was a, a, a we we co connected through motorcycle uh, helmet activism and he taught me to we did a little helmet that was this big I put it on here like this with the crown and I thought everything's gonna be fine I'll get a ticket and it'll give me a story so I was kinda of baiting the cops so to speak although my my friend says you can't be baited if there's probable cause but now now he's an anarchist, and we we you know been nudging each other um, back and forth. So um, so as far as um, uh, the the Freedomizer Radio, I had grown so far into into the zero government position uh, that I started. I think to it became too too personal and too um, radical of me, and I I couldn't take. I just I just couldn't take listening to the statists anymore telling me, well, you know, you just got to vote for Ron Paul. You know, it's oh, so, you know, I, I gave a lot of information medically, and uh, and did you know, for example, when I started doing some number crunching, that DUIs, the the nation has this whole thing about you know, dr uh, don't drive drunk, and yeah, I say don't drive drunk also or impaired or whatever. I mean that's a safety issue, obviously. Um, but according to the CDC, which I call it the Center for Disease Continuation, um, according to them, 10,000 people or so are killed by as a result of drunk driving per year. Now, when you compare those numbers to the numbers of people that are dying as a result of medical errors and the doctors and, and the hospitals and nurses, um, you are 40 times more likely to be killed by a deadly doctor than a drunk driver. So why why is why have we failed to convey this information and that is because it benefits the state for us to remain the little sheeple the indoctrinated sheeple that most of us are and 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 and, and you feel when you're awake and you're I'm fortunate not not I, this sounds badly I loved my parents but they're both dead 
So I've heard a lot of people who, you know, are in the closet with their anti-government um, uh, philosophies because they don't want to um, rock the boat with their families and their communities and stuff like that. I'm very fortunate that, number one, my husband is with me 100% now. Um, my family supports me, my son and my daughter, um, and, and they're older and they've, they've given me some grandchildren now, which is thrilling. And that... Um, and that my um, and that I don't really have to I don't I don't have to um, I don't have those kind of stressors to be out of the closet. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a really good point that you bring up. I, you know, I come from sort of a background of conservatism. Uh, my father was a Marine, and my son is a Marine, and uh, he's uh, my son's three years into a six-year contract, and. He, he's very disenchanted and he wants out and this kind of thing, you know, he's just kind of biding his time and he's uh, fortunately a reservist and so he's not, um, he's not active all the time, but he still, uh, you know, suffers with this indoctrination every once a month he goes back in and they try to fill his head full of all kinds of new stuff and or old stuff <laughs> and uh, um it's an interesting conundrum, you know. We, most of us as anarchists, we didn't start out that way from, you know, as children. Uh, we came to these conclusions through a series of rational decisions that led us here. But that does not necessarily mean that all of our friends and family have been with us on that journey. And so I think it can be a real struggle for some people to um, to overcome statism because of the pressures of of. Uh, the statism being a religion in their family, you know, it's it's almost like they're turning away from uh, the people that they love uh, by disagreeing them, with them on this. And I, and I think that may be why some of these people become constitutionalists and this kind of thing because they try to come at things from an ethical standpoint, but at the same time, uh, they don't want to turn off everyone around them you know, the, uh, all of their loved ones. And so uh, it's interesting that you've brought up that theme in your life a couple of times, you know, and you yourself were a Marine. So I, I'm wondering if you could shed some light on how you've dealt with that over the years. You know, it uh, it was the transition for you to become an anarchist over the last several years, it sounds like. And, uh, uh, you know, do you have any insight as to how people can deal with that? Um. Yeah, my the way I dealt with it um, is uh, through motorcycle riding. Um, when I was a nurse, I I was stressed out because of the you know the 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 injustices that I saw and the people that were being killed, and I felt somewhat powerless. But where I did have power, I did speak up because I was always a contract nurse. So the worst that can happen to me would be that I'd I'd lose a contract, and I if there was a nursing shortage, I could get a contract anywhere. Um, but I, um, I, I, when I was in the Marine Corps, I had an incident that occurred to me, and I don't want to sound like I'm playing the victim role because I'm not at all. But I did get um, some um, some benefits, military benefits through that in uh, for PTSD, and it was an incident. It wasn't during war or anything like that. It was um, it was something that you know it, I, I'd rather not talk about right now, but because it's just, I don't mind talking about it, but we'll just keep it short. So I have. Um, a shrink that I go to, a vet veteran's um, shrink that is assigned to me and I would go to him every six months and he was drugging me uh, with um, with uh, Zoloft, antidepressants. And as you know, a lot of people are on antidepressants. And I've gotten myself off of uh, the Zoloft. And I've gotten, and, and you know, I've, I, Zoloft has some really yucky sexual side effects. And so I tried other different different types of medicate, um, uh, SS is you know for anti-depression and um, I'm seeing that all of these people uh, so many military are coming back and they're being they're being drugged mm -hmm. and and that's 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 the first thing that needs to happen is we need to try to get off of that but it's dangerous to come off of the medications because there's a very high rate of suicide when you come off of those medications so so um, the way that I I kind of coped with you with understanding how immoral it was. I mean, every time somebody said thank you for your service, you know, I, you know, it made me feel good. Um, but then I'm thinking uh, I don't want to ever be thanked for my service because first of all, 
And and if people realize this, first of all, our economy is so bad in this country that a lot of people are turning to the military as just a means to make money. Uh, you know, but it's but it's not it's it's not good money. It's stolen money. Um, today I sit here humbly admitting that I some people may want to call me a hypocrite or whatever but I get 435 or six dollars a month from the VA and I get um, medical you know I have medical benefits which I rarely use so um, when I first came to to terms with this I had to I you know I, I I'm a Stefan Molyneux uh, follower and it's like he one of his podcasts gave me comfort um, in in recognizing that 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 don't blame the person who's accepting the 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 benefits. Uh, blame the system. I mean, and and do what you can. And I and, and I've had another uh, attorney who said, well, you know, aren't you kind of a hypocrite because you're advocating zero government, but both you and your husband are living off of the government. You know, with you know his retirement and his his. Uh, re both retirement from the Marine Corps and his, uh, you know, Social Security, and I said, yeah, I will, I will admit that. However, I will, unlike many, I will never be the person who will protest when it gets taken away, because it's gonna be taken away. Yeah, um, and you know, and some, sometimes people don't realize too, it's a, it's a vastly different thing, you know, hypocrisy. Uh, if you were advocating for something like that uh, or advocating against it and then seeking it out but it's not that we seek those kinds of things out we are living in the system and we we have to live in the system that we're in it's almost like being in the matrix you know it, uh, you know on the movie it's not like you could just choose to to not abide by the rules that were all around you and being enforced by you I mean uh, we're in the system at gunpoint you know, we don't have a choice necessarily mm -hmm. to just go out and form some free society somewhere and just completely detach ourselves from this at this point. Now, I know that a lot of people are uh, working toward that, but that's a process. And I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because it's come up several times recently. I've noticed in you know Facebook chatter and that kind of thing. Uh, this is maybe a tangent here, but uh, Elon Musk, uh, who... Uh, owns Tesla motor vehicles. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but uh, he recently released all his patents for his electric car to be used by other car manufacturers. Uh, he wants a free and open market on it. And uh, in the past, he's, he's also developing SpaceX, which is a private uh, space exploration program um, apart from the government. Well, some of the you know the loudest critics that come out as uh, against him right away was that oh well. It's not like he's an ANCAP. He's also taking 500,000 or 500 million from the government in grants and all this. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's the system we live in. Of course, those, in, you know, those incentives have to be taken advantage of because it, it, it's not fair to say that we have to abide by helmet laws, seatbelt laws, uh, mm -hmm. anti-gun carrying laws. We have to pay these taxes. We have to uh, do this and that all on the negative side. But then we're a hypocrite if anything positive happens to us as a result of the government. Not to mention the fact that that positive and negative balance is, is way off. So, yeah, I, I just and wanted I, to address I, that right there because I, I hear that a lot, and I and I'm, so I'm sticking up for you on that one because I don't think it's hypocrisy that we're being forced to live into the system and take advantage of it. Um, there, there – the fact that I am taking this money is is I do have a choice. I can say don't give it to me anymore. But the other way to look at it, which I think is valid, and I encourage people if they qualify for welfare, get the damn welfare. The sooner you bust the 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 they make you make the the U.S. go bankrupt, the sooner we're going to know freedom. And it's not going to be an easy road. I do believe what Jeff Berwick has been um, evangelizing that the dollar is it's it's already in collapse, and there's going to be some really hard things that are going to be coming down down the pike. So what what I do is I you know I'm t I'm taking it I'm I'm I've released myself of that guilt of taking that money and living the way that I live, but at the same same time I'm looking at ways one of the most probably the most important thing that I'm doing is I raise my children I 
Southern Baptist. I raised my children um, in the way that I demanded that they respect me. And I'm all into peaceful parenting now. Uh, Stefan Molyneux, is, is, I give him a lot of credit for that. And even though I hit my children and I, you know, I did, you know, I, I spanked them and I brutalized them and I did psychological things to, to, to harm them, which I, I am extremely remorseful and I have told them that I am remorseful about that but what what has come out of that is that I have been they have been open to listen to me um, give them advice about how to raise their children my grandchildren more peacefully and my both of my children are monumentally better parents than I ever was and and so this is how we're going to change the world one family at a time I mean that they the marriage the, the family unit um, building Building communities, there it is possible to have voluntarism, which we call anarchy. Um, every time you spank a child, you're you're it, that's that's a win for the state because it's telling them don't don't think, um, do do what we tell you to do. So so I completely support people who you know are on welfare. Use it. I mean, if you're if you're out of the matrix, don't feel guilty about it. Use it. I know somebody who's who's making a who has done some contract work in Afghanistan and, and the Middle East um, and was raking in the dough and it was tax money. And you know I. I I, he was also he was a, a, an um, um, a, an anarchist, but but he was with me and he says we need to we need to do whatever it takes and if anybody can qualify get them in there and I'm thinking I'm I'm going to sue this government agency and I'm going to get money from these you know just the sooner but you know I'm I'm past that now I'm at the at the and and I want to also bring up. When you get awakened, it's it's finding out that Santa Claus isn't there. It, it doesn't exist, um, and that's that's tragic for a little kid. Like, really, Santa Claus? I mean, but but it doesn't usually happen that somebody says Santa Claus doesn't exist. You know, it's like you start you know putting two and two together, and then you start thinking, well, the world's kind of big, and how is it that the you know with a sled, and I don't have a chimney. How do I how do you come down my chimney? You know, and um, but. Uh, when when you're an adult and you come to these truths that that you've been indoctrinated into not believing or you, you were stuck in the matrix, you go through I, I, very similar feelings of 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 um, grief, and you know it's been studied and there's you know your five stages of grief. I think I can remember them. It's um, denial. Um, it's um, let's see denial. Is it bargaining, depression, eventually it's acceptance? I'm missing one, but oh, anger. So, mm -hmm. so I've been fluctuating between um, anger, which has uh, I thought initially it alienated a lot of Facebook friends. A lot of Facebook people just said, you know, I don't want to listen to her. I got off of some groups, some groups, you know, got, you know, like the motorcycle groups. They said, you know, we don't want need to hear her bashing cops and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I, I. I I be, that was that was because I was so angry. Um, so then I would go into this depression mode. You know, it's like I'm, I'm I would be severely depressed because it's like, how can people not see it? How can people who have lost loved ones because of the state not recognize that the solution is not to go back to father's piece of paper? And how can they not? How can they not do? I, you know, and sometimes I think that the more education, the more educated a person is, the harder it is for them to detach from the state because they've had so much intellectual investment into into the state, and um, and so by going through this, you know this depression mode um, we have a, a house with three stories and um, the the basement I like the basement because when I get really depressed I like to just I don't want any sun 
I just want to, I'll take some Xanax and just go to sleep and I say, I'll, I'll feel better in the morning. And um, I've, I'm lucky that I've got, you know, my husband kind of, kind of, you know, soothes that a little bit. But I have a really good, my friend David Stilwell, the founder of Gorilla Lawfare, he's my, I consider him my best friend. He called, he would call me up, he'd say, Tiger Lily, get up off your fat ass. There's work to do, you know. So so I, I've got that to kind of help put, nudge me along. And the, the best thing that I've got, um, right now on on the books is I'm taking a motorcycle trip that is that is my antidepressant um, a motorcycle trip from Utah I've done it by myself already where I've gone from Utah to San Antonio to um, Indianapolis because my grandkids are in near San Antonio and in Indianapolis and back avoiding the state of Nebraska because they have a helmet law wasn't able to avoid Missouri, a hundred miles of Missouri. They have a helmet law, but I just put on a fake, a bowl over my head, and you know, a hoodie, and 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 got through there as fast as I could. But that is the best. That's when I feel the best. I also love the beach, and that's something I kind of tease my husband. I say, "You lied to me. You told me, you know, when we were dating, and and we're trying to find what we like in common." He was a widower when I met him, so he had a son that was like in his early teens. And and uh, I says, oh, I love the beach. And he says, oh yeah, I love the beach too. And and I like roller coasters. Oh yeah, I like. Ro he was full of shit. He was just trying to get in my knickers and trying to get me <laughs> married. And it worked, you know. So so but and then I said, um, you know, after after we were married, um, you know what? One one of the things, and I have like not literally a bucket list, but in my mind, I have a bucket list of things. And one of the bucket lists that I had was to make love on the beach. And when I said that to him about 10 years ago, he says, Ew, you want to get sand up your, you know what? <laughs> and I'm like, well, not if you put it that way, you uh, you know, romantic old devil, you, you know? So, but. Yeah, before they're married, every, every man is a salesman before they're married. No kidding. He totally duped me on that one, you know? I mean, he scammed me. And, you know, the stupid things men do. I mean, I can list a whole thing, a thing, but, you know, by and large, he is like the perfect man for me, and he supports me, he adores me. We've get, had a very good marriage for for the you know with our you know bumps and and everything, but 32 years, my God, that's that's almost yeah. unheard of in in this day and age, especially you know I, I I was there for a while. I was thinking as soon as my kids are grown, I'm gonna ditch this guy because you know he's on my last nerve, you know. But as it turned out, you know we just we grew to to um, find common ground, and we've been learning a lot. And this anarchy thing has really bonded us greatly. And now I don't like taking long motorcycle rides with him. I took one from when I stopped being a nurse. One of the first things we did is we rode from San Jose, California, all the way to Key West, and. Um, I about murdered him. I mean, I wanted him dead. I mean, he, I like to just ride. Sometimes I go 110 miles an hour, and I don't mind saying this publicly. And yeah, it's against the law. I don't give a fat fig that it's against the law. If the roads are good and my motorcycle is mechanically okay and I feel good, I get an adrenaline rush going 110 to 120 miles an hour and I scream and say yahoo and it just feels so good. But you know, if you're with a partner, you got to kind of, you know, compromise. So I don't like that. And then he's a smoker too. I'm not a smoker, but I don't keep him from smoking. But so he's got to stop every freaking 50 miles to smoke. And then and then and, and then he, since I, he knew that it's like, I, I can go, I've done 920 miles in like, I don't know, six, 16 hours, you know, to try to get to, I almost got to San Antonio, but not quite. And um, that was from Las Vegas. And so my I, my ass, I mean, when I'm, I'm doing, you know, Kegel exercises and butt crunching and everything. And so I just love to be by myself and just go as fast as and stop when I want and pull over and do so. And my husband, every 50 miles, um, I got to eat, I got to smoke, I got to drink, I got to check my email, my voicemail, my text messages, and my favorite. Will you scratch my back? You know, it's like, no. Uh -uh. <laughs> so there have only been two people that I have met, and I've met them just randomly on the road 
that I wouldn't mind going a long distance with. Both of them are men, and you know, um, uh, uh, but they they were very impressed with you know uh, they are lone riders also because they like to go fast or go slow, and it's like um, uh, and I have a friend that wants to go with me. So the point is that one of the things that I'm going to do to heal is to go all the way as far south of the border as I possibly can, as I possibly can. If I can go all the way to Panama, that's my that's my goal. Awesome. And I'm going to be and I'm so, going to be doing this in the next couple of weeks. So you're leaving go. with a small group then? No, okay. hell no. Just Are you me. kidding? Me? Just me. Just I you. Spanish. I you know and, you and you know other connections in Mexico or anywhere yeah. else south of the border you, because I've been Facebooking that um, I, I ride a victory motorcycle I know you're a Harley guy but victory is for those people who don't know is the other American mo American motorcycle like that means anything at this point I'll get a I would love to have a BMW because you can do off-road or on-road and it gives you more versatility but um, um, uh, what was the question I, I'm just curious about how you established connections down there. I, oh, you know, I, I think that you're not alone in wanting to venture out and explore the world, whether it's on a bike or not. And I think it'd be valuable for people to try to understand how to connect with people outside of their tax farm that they live in. Well, um, I can. Uh, I, I just put it out there, and I was going to do it because at this point in my life, longevity doesn't run long in my life. My mother died at sixty. My father died at sixty-five. All of my aunts and uncles died, you know, fifties, sixties, and so I don't expect to live long. And that's that's not, you know, that's not a value thing. That I, I don't value living long. I value living in the moment and living well. That's far more superior. To living, a, I don't want to be a hundred years old and drooling on myself. You know what I mean? So I want to live now. So what? What I did was when I started posting this. Oh my God! I got so much negative feedback. You know, it's like, oh, you're gonna get killed, the drug cartels, and you better watch yourself, and you're a woman alone, and take this off your bucket list. And the more people told me not to do it, the more I wanted to say, <laughs> go blank yourself. You know? Because it. Uh, I so so I posted. So Jeff Berwick posted something on his Facebook, and I says, "Yeah, I know what you mean." And then I mentioned something about me going out there, and he says, "Hey, look me up when you come to to Acapulco." And so then um, uh, I got him. I, I signed up to his TDV um, blog or whatever, and and uh, I I met. Now, isn't it awesome though that you're getting so much <laughs> negative feedback, and then when he finds out, he's just like, "Hey, look me up when you get here." You know, there's no question about whether yes, you can do I, it. Or I not. have yeah. found four people. You know, four solid people that I know I can call or I can go to their place and crash or they can you know they can help me if I if I need um, some help and I really honest from the bottom of my heart I believe in the goodness of humanity and there have been a number of times that I've seen bikers that are out on the road especially in Las Vegas it gets so hot people can die out there if you if you don't have water and you're out in the middle of the desert you know so I've been I've been helpful to a lot of people and at the same time I've had a lot of people help me out as well I mean there was a time when I ran out of gasoline in Hawthorne Nevada on my way to meet the Congress uh, the, the, the senators of the state of Nevada during the time when I was trying to you know deal with this helmet thing and um, I ran out and I thought oh god nobody's gonna pick me up because I got a gun and I don't have a way to lock it up in my bike and and I got these boots and you know nobody's gonna pick me up so I just started walking with my thumb out yeah you know? <laughs> it's like you know expecting I was gonna have to walk three miles um, to get gasoline and I didn't have a gas can and I figured you know my feet were hurting and and I'm like I'm so screwed but you know I'm, I'll live well it was the second or third vehicle that passed me that pulled over and he was a guy in a white truck with a big old dog like a Labrador and he says hey is that your motorcycle back there and I says yeah and he says uh, uh, you ran out of gas and I says yeah and he says you want to ride I says yeah but I'm open carrying are you okay with that he goes oh yeah we all got guns around here I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> so he took me to his house and he gave me he loaned me his gas can he filled up the gas for me in, in the tank and so chivalry is not dead. I believe in the in the goodness of the human um, spirit. And I and and one time um, 
just a quick little story. I went to the first time. I, the only time I went to Sturgis was right when I was still a nurse. I was getting ready to leave nursing, and my husband and I had a lot of conflicts and stuff. And so my husband basically left me in the desert because he got pissed off at me, um, and probably for good reason, you know. But um, so he left me in the desert, and I was with another another biker who was a good friend of mine um, of ours. And Jimmy was so horrified. He says, "Oh my God, we're like in the middle of whatever." Or uh, to South Dakota or, or Colorado or something. He says, "What if something goes wrong?" And I says, "What the hell is my husband gonna do? He ain't a mechanic. I can flash my tits and get help." <laughs> before you know, I mean, come on. And I was so pissed off at men that day. Oh my god, you know. And then I was just writing and and I was writing at a forty five degree angle. I was just so angry, so mad at just you know at life and how it had turned out. And and this was before I was starting depro to deprogram from the status thing and. There were some um, some some bikers that were uh, kind of inching me. They were getting really close, and I'm like, "Oh hell no! No man is gonna pass me up today." So I'm going 110 like this, you know, with the sand and everything. And then poor Jimmy, who was following me, and I told Jimmy, "You're gonna, you know, I I know that I drive like an animal. If if you lose me, just go to the first rest area. I'll wait for you." <clears throat> poor poor Jimmy. I pulled into the rest area, and the the three guys that were behind me were hell's angels. Angels, you know, <laughs> I didn't know that. And poor Jimmy, he had his bucket head with his little, you know, and he's and he's like this, all stressed, <laughs> and right behind the hell's angels. He didn't even see me, you know. So I've had some really exciting adventures on a motorcycle, and I really think that even just by going alone is going to be. I can t use that as a, uh, to my advantage because I'm a happy person. People are interested, you know. They're that when they, especially with with a gun and a motorcycle and a female. Of course, I can't take my gun or anything like that to Mexico. I know that. Um, but but people, you know, ought to gravitate towards me. And it's sometimes I even had to put the the mean face on, like don't talk to me because <clears throat> I would be on a schedule because I didn't want to do lodging for two days and I had to do 700 miles in one day. So you know, I would I would just you know focus laser focus. Yeah. yeah, so I've been in contact with some people uh, with Jeff Berwick's um uh, Facebook um, uh, friends. One person lives in Monterey, Mexico, and um, I I didn't get his connection through through Jeff Berwick. I got it through the VMC um, Facebook page uh, group, which is Victory Motorcycle Club. And um, he says he lives in Monterey, Mexico, which I lived there for 18 months as an adult um, in, in, in the early 1990s, late at 1980s or whatever. And um, and it's it's kind of like the armpit of Mexico. It's industrial. I don't plan to go there, but I have a point of contact and and on that Facebook group he was talking about he says he has gone north south east west everywhere and he has never been bothered by any police officer and Jeff Berwick says the most difficult part of your journey is going to be getting get at least just getting to the border because all of the cops are so much more violent in the United States that they are in Mexico and if people knew how free Mexico is the floodgates would open and people would want to go there but they're so into CNN ABC CBS Fox News and all of that telling everybody that you know the the drug cartels and and you know that you're gonna get killed and they're targeting tourists and all of that. That's bull. I mean, it's of course you know you're gonna have your your case here and your case there. That's I, but I don't go. I'm not going there with that expectation. I absolutely I'm prepared. I've got some um, defensive. Uh, alternative defensive things if I need to because I plan to camp a tent on the beach. The beach, I love the beach. I'm going to get the sunshine. I'm going to get, um, for exercising, I'm going to ride the waves. And I'm sure uh, I will I will find friends and and I won't be telling them hey I'm an anarchist but you know just you know talk to them and a lot of people you'd be surprised a lot of you you probably aren't, aren't surprised a lot of people are closet anarchists or or you know I'm I'm, I'm hosting a, a, a an RN from uh, Louisiana in my house right now and she's she's got a really interesting case about what happened but but She's been in my house like for three days now, and I've listened to her case. She's got a she's got a, a an extremely fascinating case, but um, 
she, you know, when I talked to her on the phone, you could tell she still wants the government to fix this, you know. Now she's like, she's a, a lot closer to, you know what, the answer isn't in creating more laws. The answer is in repealing those laws that are protecting the people who have victimized you. Right. And she's, she's, she's on board. And um, it's going to be really, it's really going to be cool. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, do you plan on uh, sharing your adventure online at any point? Is there any way we can follow your journey or catch up to you at some point in the journey? Sure. Um, I have a. Um, I, um, my name on Facebook is tigerlily.gzz, and that's tiger and li lily. L I L Y dot G Z Z, which is short. It's an abbreviation. It's just like Williams, W M S is the sh abbreviation for Williams. G Z Z is the abbreviation for Gonzalez when you when your last name ends with a Z. So it's everything I do is kind of um, Tiger Lily dot G Z Z. Um, so I had um, a friend who wanted to go with me mainly because he was fearing for my life, you know, which I don't, you know, I told him stay home you know come find me when I'm there already you know I don't want to go through that but um, he told me that he has a friend who and he lives he was born in Oaxaca Mexico and he lives in um, in Southern California and he says that he has a friend who is a Mexican senator in Baja and he called me he was so alarmed he said my friend the senator said please 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 do not post anything about your whereabouts or where you're going or anything on Facebook because the cartels are are targeting these people and it doesn't make sense to me and I says you know what first of all the senator better it, it is right to be afraid because the government in Mexico is who's being targeted and Jeff Berwick told a story about a, some cops that killed a, a family member of somebody. The community rose up, they beheaded the mayor, killed the cop, and put, set fire to the police station. And, you know, and we in America, we think, oh, how uncivilized that is. But, you know, that's not very far from what the founding fathers had to do to break off from the tyranny of King George, which, by the way, is nothing compared to the tyranny that we have now. So, so and, 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 it, and these constitutionalists who, uh, who are so alarmed that the Mexicans governments and other governments, third world governments, are so uh, uncivilized, they're the same ones that, that are spouting off that Thomas Jefferson said, when the government fears people, there is freedom, and when the people fear government, there is tyranny. So that, how can they say that? It's such a contradiction, and not recognize that Mexico, if it is doing that, it's doing exactly what Thomas Jefferson advocated. Yeah, many ways freer than we are. It, it was ironic to me when I was visiting Mexico, uh, and we were just in a touristy area, you know, but uh, it, it was ironic to me how many uh, Americans and Canadians were down there and enjoying it, and uh, they could hardly see past the beach and the tourist shops, and they didn't realize that one of the reasons they felt so good is that they did not have that oppression on them all the time. You know, I, uh, I could walk down the sidewalk with a drink in my hand, and nobody was hounding me about an open container or any of this BS. Uh, we were there for about 10 days. I saw two cops in 10 days. You know, one had pulled over a driver, which was amazing to me, seeing how everybody else was driving. And, uh, and then the other one was actually directing traffic and stopped traffic for us to be able to cross and was very polite and, and kind to us. And it actually oh, took me back because I'm not used to cops being that. <laughs> polite, <laughs> you know, they, they, right. they around here they all look down at you like oh, this big authority kind of thing. I thought those two cops in ten days, and and uh, where I live here in the Portland area, I see two, three, four cops on my way to work. You know, it's it's amazing the contrast that I saw down there, and people just don't even seem to pick up on that. It really amazes me. But right. uh, you know, and, I'm and I'm oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the the Mexican police. There's there's two. You got the federales, which are the like you know the equivalent maybe of the SWAT. You you know because they have a lot of power, uh, more power. You wouldn't want to mess with them. Um, but the but the cops, you know, you, the the local cops, um, they make their money by taking bribes. They'll pull somebody over and say you were speeding, and uh, the the person, the victim that they pulled over, um, gives them five dollars or whatever. And when I lived out there in Mexico, my husband 
probably gave away maybe fifty dollars in the eighteen months that we were there because we had California license plates and a nice car, so we were kind of a magnet for being pulled over. And I must have been pulled over, I don't know, fifty times, and I never gave them one penny because, and I wasn't rude or anything, and I was, and and this was way back before I was even awakened. Um, but all I do talk 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 and and it's like you know what I ain't gonna get nothing out of this bitch you know <laughs> let me move on to some lower hanging fruit you know so and that's kind of the the position that I'm gonna take oh really I was speeding oh I'm sorry about that or oh really Mexico has a helmet law oh okay well I'll put it on and okay well you're gonna have to pay me I just I so I'm, I'm I already know how I'm gonna deal with them and and I'm gonna take like um little stuffed toys. I can't take a lot on a motorcycle. I've learned how to really uh, do compressed things. But I'm going to take things with me like um, like a DVD player that I don't use and stuff like that and I say, you know what, I really like my DVD player but if this will help me get out of this, you know, just, you know, it's re it works really good. Here's the, you know, whatever. I'm just gonna. I'm just whatever it takes. I want to have fun, and when people when people say, "Well, how 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 is it that you can bribe them?" Well, what's I'd rather bribe somebody? Jeff Ber Berwick made this point: bribe somebody with fifty bucks not to go to jail than to have to deal with the cops in the United States that will that if you offer them a bribe, you get not only charged for whatever it is that they stopped you, but then you get an added bribe onto that. You know, so yeah, well, so and then it, the time, yeah, the time of going to court and fighting everything. I mean, it's it's a no-win situation up here. There's just no easy way out. <laughs> right. Well, I'm really excited for your journey. I I secretly wish we could get more anarchists on motorcycles because, uh, first of all, I'd like the the connection there. But uh, it, there's a sense of freedom on the back of a motorcycle that is indescribable if you have not experienced it. So um, I'm partly envious, but really excited for your journey. Um, it, it, before I let you go, is there any other uh, links or any other things you'd like to promote as far as being able to find you or things that you'd just like to get out to people? Well, my YouTube is youtube.com slash T-G-R-L-I-L-G-Z-Z. And um, people can just pause this and, you know, listen to it over again. But um, I'm, I've am i got a domain name, and I'm my my website is under construction. I'm hoping to get that um, off and running before I leave. And the that website is going to be tlroars.com. Just TL Roars, like a tiger roars, tiger mm -hmm. lily roars. Dot com, and that you know, I've got a lot of blogs, and they're like all over the place. I got my healthcare blog, and I've got you know my my motorcycle um, blog, and and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be um, updating people where I am. Probably what I'll do um, is the day after I leave, when I go to a cafe that has internet in Mexico, I'll upload stuff. Um, uh, and and I'm I'm a lot of people have been giving me some really great ideas on how I can do this in an e economical way. You know, just upload all my stuff into YouTube's and you know let people know where I am and how I'm doing. And I suspect I'm going to find a whole bunch of new friends. And I I can't wait to meet Jeff Berwick and uh, and the four other pe the three or four other people that that are waiting for me to meet me out there in Mexico in various parts. Uh, Mazatlan is one of them. I think Puerto Vallarta. Um, and uh, Hali, uh, somewhere in Guadalajara, I believe. So, but I plan, I plan to go as, you know, even even as I would love to go to Nicaragua and all the way to Panama. So I'll just play that by ear. So, mm -hmm. but I also wanted to um, um, give you a a huge shout out because I, when I heard about you and you reached out to me for this podcast, I looked you up and um, your stuff is really, really good. Um, you have a post about how to talk. Datist, and and the article itself was really good, um, but you had a couple of status people argue with you, and the way you handled it was masterful. And so I want to encourage anybody who's listening to this podcast and has not seen your work. That is a really, really. It gave me comfort. It gave me ideas because we're not going to win this uh, freedom, um, this freedomness. For humanity, uh, with with attacks and shrills and finger pointing, we're gonna win it with reason. It's gonna be multi generational and it's gonna begin with peaceful parenting. If we can do that for our children and not violate them, then and them not know what violence is, um, 
I think that's that's going to be the solution. So, but, but the hard times coming ahead, and maybe the hard times are going to happen while I'm in Mexico, and I'll have all my family smuggle themselves across the border, and I'll have a little <laughs> place for them there. So, who knows? Right on. Thank well, you so much for having me. You bet. It's been my pleasure and my honor. I'm, I'm humbled by your recommendations. Um, I look forward to following your journey and seeing where it all goes. Thanks Great. for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.